Hey, good morning, Chehi family. I hope that you are doing well today, and it's good to be back with you on this Tuesday morning as we continue to talk about the subject of hope. Uh, over the last couple of weeks, if you were able to uh, join us for the messages, uh, we've been looking at what, what it means to have hope and what hope God offers us. And we began this journey with uh, looking at a man named Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth uh, was the grandson of King Saul, son of Jonathan. And we saw how David uh, showed kindness to Mephibosheth and how he restored hope to a hopeless man. And really just an amazing picture of the hope that God offers to you and I through Jesus Christ. And last week we looked at Jesus touching and healing a leper and how he brought hope to this person and how he brought hope to his life by touching the hopeless parts of his life. And God does want to give you and I hope. He wants his children to live in and with hope. But there's something that we all face and go through that makes hope hard, and that's fear. And so this morning, I just want you to think a little bit about fear. And specifically the question, what is, what, or what are you, let me say, state that a little differently, what are you afraid of? What scares you? Is there an area of life that particularly causes fear to well up in you? Now, everyone deals with fear to some level, and God has given us the capacity to experience and feel fear. Not all fears are bad. Some fears protect us, right? There, there are certain fears that are, that are good, that, that, that are good for us because they protect us, they keep us safe. But then there are other fears that are not good. And the problem isn't that we have these fears or that we experience fear or that we feel fear because all of us do and all of us will. The issue is what do we do with our fears? Because fear is an enemy of hope. If we're going to live with hope and the hope that God wants us to have, we have to deal with fear. And the message of Jesus is a hope-filled message. The message of Jesus and the life of Jesus points to the fact that Jesus was and is Israel's Messiah. He came as God's promise to his people, but he didn't just come for the people of Israel. He came for everyone. And that was shocking to the Jews especially. But he came to not just deliver them politically. In fact, that wasn't his main, his main purpose, but he came to set them free from the penalty and the power of sin. He came to set them free so that they could know him, so that they could experience forgiveness and life and life in his kingdom. And he came to inaugurate and announce that kingdom. And Jesus came and he lived for us and he died in our place. He rose from the dead. He ascended to the Father where he rules and he reigns. And he's coming one day in power and in glory. And in the meantime, he invites anyone and everyone who would come to him to receive forgiveness of their sin, to receive his presence in their life, to receive his promises to live by, his purposes to live for, and a future in his kingdom that will never end. And that is an incredibly hope-filled message. And it's my prayer and it's my desire that, that the message of Jesus and the life of Jesus and what he did for you has caused you to experience the living hope that only Jesus can give you. But this hope that we have, this hope that we have sometimes is hard for us to experience in the meantime, right? Because we have this incredible hope of our future with God, right? And, and what he's going to give us and what we're going to experience for all of eternity. But right now he calls us to live in this world where sometimes having faith and maintaining faith in God and living in and with hope is difficult, and reality has a way sometimes of obscuring our faith. Reality has a way of, of, of just sometimes messing with our minds in, in a way that makes faith difficult. And fear sometimes begins to creep into our lives. And I really believe that fear is the number one enemy of our hope. That fear steals hope. And so I, I want to just talk a little bit about fear today and and specific, I want us to look at what Jesus has to say about our fears and from that, hopefully encourage you and me to know what we can do when we're experiencing fear and when we feel like fear is stealing our hope. You know, there are a lot of things uh, that cause us to feel fear. 
And, and, and right now with everything going on in our world, whether it's with COVID-19 or just the struggles or challenges that you're facing or you look at our, our country and our world and all the turmoil that's going on, there are a lot of things, there are a lot of really valid reasons that we could come up with for being afraid, right? Again, whether it's COVID-19, whether it's politics, whether it's accidents, failure, finances, struggles, relationships, right? The list could go on. In fact, when we think about fear, we think about phobias, there are over 520 documented phobias, right? We are people who are prone to fear. But perhaps our, our greatest fear is the fear of the unknown. I, I really believe that probably more than any other fear, it's the fear of the unknown that causes us to struggle to have hope and to struggle sometimes to have faith. And that fear really becomes a thief in our lives. And so if you have your Bible, I want to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 6. And in Matthew chapter 6, in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, we find ourselves getting to read the words that Jesus spoke on the, what we call the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon that was ever preached. And I want us to can just consider a few of Jesus' words on the subject of, of worry and fear and what he offers us so that we can experience living hope, even when we're feeling or experiencing fear. So let's begin Matthew chapter 6, verse 25 and verse 26. We'll start there. Jesus says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. For is life, is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? And so in this section, Jesus is addressing the subject of, of, of worry and fear. And he says, I'm telling you, don't worry about your life. Right? Jesus very plainly, very bluntly says, don't worry about your life. That word worry that Jesus used there means to be pulled in different directions. And I think a lot of us can identify with that feeling where life feels like it's pulling us in so many different directions, especially mentally, right? And we, we read the news and we watch the news and this is going on and that's going on and the uncertainty and the unknowns. And, and I think, you know, life in the future is always unknown from our perspective. It's not unknown from God's perspective. He sees the end from the beginning. He knows all of that. And so God's never surprised or perplexed or overwhelmed by what happens because it never surprises him. But from our perspective, from our vantage point, the future is always unknown. And that's always been true. But more than ever, we sense that and feel that, especially with all the uncertainty that this COVID-19 season has brought into our lives, because everything seems more uncertain than ever. And how do we cope with that? And how do we deal with that? And that's a challenge. I have a lightning bug that just uh, flew in here. Uh, the challenges of doing things outside, I just want to make sure it wasn't a wasp. So um, that's what I was looking at. The, the challenge with all the uncertainty that, that we face is how do, I, how, do I, how do I keep myself from feeling pulled in every direction, mentally and emotionally, even physically? Jesus says, don't worry about your life. And then notice what he says. He says, don't worry about your life. Don't worry about what you'll eat or drink. Don't, don't worry about your needs being met, what you'll wear. He says, and then he asks a rhetorical question. He says, is life not more than food and the body more than clothes? And what Jesus is driving at here is that he wanted his listeners, those that were listening to him that day, and through the inspiration of inspiring Matthew to record these words for us, all followers of Jesus. He wanted all of us to hear his words and to know that there is a purpose in life. Jesus says, is life not more than food and the body more than clothes? Jesus is saying, there's something greater for you to live for than just surviving. Life isn't just about surviving. And sometimes, sometimes life feels like it's just about surviving. And there's some days where you just kind of have to hang on and just think, I just got to get through today. I just got to survive. But ultimately, God wants you to know, Jesus wants you to know that there is a purpose for your life, right? And that he created you on purpose. And if you're a child of God, if you're a follower of Jesus, he saved you on purpose 
for a purpose. One of my favorite verses, and I've shared it with the Chehi family many times, is Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. And it says, for we are God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. You're God's masterpiece. You're, you're some of his best creation. Literally that word in the, in the Greek is the word that we get our word poem from. You are a well-composed, well-thought-out, created being. He says, you're God's masterpiece and you were created in Christ Jesus. Speaking of our salvation, you were, you were saved. He says, you're God's masterpiece. You were created in Christ Jesus for a purpose, for good works, which God prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. God has a purpose for your life. God has a plan for your life. And, and it's understanding God's purpose for your life, the value that he has for your life that is going to be key part of the key to defeating those feelings of fear and anxiety and worry that are going to come into your life. There's not probably going to be a time where those feelings don't pop into your mind. There there isn't probably going to be a time where we don't struggle with those things. I still do. I struggle with fear. I struggle with worry. I deal with anxiety, right? It's not that those things will just go away, but it's what we do and how we respond to them that's key and critical in our lives. And so Jesus wanted his listeners to know, and he wants you to know, that there is a purpose for your life. But, but not just a purpose for your life. There is a value on your life. He said uh, to his listeners, as he referenced the birds, he says, are you not much more valuable than they? Again, another rhetorical question. A question that's not designed for an immediate answer, but a question that's designed to make you and I think. Are you not much more valuable than they? Jesus wanted his followers to know, and he wants you to know, that he values you, that you have value simply because you are a human being created in his image. He formed you in your mother's womb. He knows everything about you. He sees you, he knows you, he loves you, and you have value because you are an image bearer of the God who created you. And so your life has purpose and your life has value. And these are gonna be key things to defeating the fear and the worry and the anxiety that creeps into our life. And we're gonna come back to them. But let's continue on in Matthew chapter six. Look at verse 27. Jesus takes things a little bit further. He says, can any of you, another rhetorical question. He did, these are like sort of rapid fire rhetorical questions. Can any of you by worrying at a single hour to your life? So Jesus says, not only do you have purpose and value, and that should help help you defeat fear and worry in your life, but he says, I want you to even think about your worrying. What good is your worrying doing? He says, by all of your worrying, you're not changing your circumstances any. Right? That, that worrying is a, is a futile exercise because it doesn't help us. He says, can you add a single hour to your life by worrying? What is your worrying actually accomplishing you. Jesus goes on and talks about the things that we sometimes worry about. He says, why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. Jesus says, don't worry about your needs being met. Don't worry about whether I'm going to take care of you or not. He says, don't let your life become consumed with worry about yourself. And really, a lot of our worries really get intensified when we start to focus on ourselves. Focusing on ourselves is one of the worst things that we can do for ourselves. And, and even mentally and, and through psycho- psychology, now we know these things are true, right? Not only did Jesus say them, but we know that they're true. That when we focus, when we become consumed with self, right? It, it always leads to things that aren't good and especially leads to, to worry and anxiety and fear. 
And so Jesus is saying, don't focus so much on yourself. Don't worry about your needs being met. I see, he says, your father, your heavenly father knows what you need. You know, I have two kids. My, my daughter, Lena Joy, is 10. She'll be 11 here in a couple of weeks, which is sort of a terrifying thought uh, and exciting all at the same time. And my son's eight. And I, I love being a dad. Uh, it's, it's just one of the great joys and delights of my life. And I love being able to provide for my kids. I, I love to be able to provide them a sense of safety and security. I love to see to it that their needs are met. And I like sometimes to even spoil them and do things for them that 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 they don't need, but just to just to bless them and to bring a smile to their face. And I'm I'm so far from a perfect dad, right? I am not a perfect dad. I'm nowhere near a perfect dad. But your father in heaven is a perfect father, and he sees and he knows and he cares. And Jesus wanted you, his listeners, that day to know that. He wants you and I to know that. So he says, we don't have to live fearful that God won't come through for us. We don't have to live fearful that God doesn't know what we need. But instead, he says, lift your eyes off of yourself. He says, so he says, know that you have a purpose. Know that you have value. Take your eyes off of yourself. And then he says in verse 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. He says, he says, instead of worrying about all these things and all the what ifs, he says, I want you to, to seek first my kingdom and my righteousness. I want you to seek my purposes for your life. He says, therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. Don't try to live in tomorrow. Make plans, yes. Always with open hands, though, that God may redirect or change those plans. Make provisions, right? It, the Bible isn't saying that we shouldn't look to the future or plan for the future, but he's saying, don't worry about tomorrow. You can't live in tomorrow. He says, don't worry about, he says, tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. All right, Jesus is not denying that life for us in this age is difficult and sometimes filled with trouble. And he says, don't try to take on all of tomorrow's trouble today. Just live today knowing that you have a purpose, knowing that you're valued, taking eyes off of self and circumstance and putting them on him. Jesus says, live, <coughs> excuse me, live for my kingdom, live for, for my purposes, the rule and the reign of God, seek the righteousness of Christ. And he says, then God will see to it that your needs are met. Now, I, I wish that we could all just agree, yes, we'll do this. Yes, I believe Jesus. And I, I know you do. I do. But it's hard. It's hard to actually live this out. And again, fear and doubts and worries, they come into our mind and they become so strong and powerful sometimes. And, and then we think, man, there, there's so many good reasons to worry about tomorrow, right? There's a thousand what ifs that lie in front of us. You know, what if, what if the country shuts down again? What if my job goes away? What if school does this? What if I fail? What if something bad happens? What if I get sick? What if so-and-so gets elected? What if, what if, what if? And we can what if ourselves to death. But you know, as I was thinking about that, I think really what we're thinking when we're what ifing ourselves like that is that we're really saying, God, what if you're not good? God, what if you fail? God, what if your promises aren't true? That's the real what if. We're saying, God, what if you're going to fail me? Now, we don't mean to say that. We don't really even want to say that. It's not our, our conscious thought. But maybe more than we're willing to admit, when we're worrying about the future or what if, our, what ifing ourselves to death, it's really because we're taking our eyes off of God and our eyes off of our Savior Jesus, who's made these incredible promises to us. And we're putting them on self and circumstances. And we're really doubting that God is going to come through for us. So, how do we do this? It's not easy, it's something we have to learn, it's something that requires patience, right? We're going to stumble and fall. We're going to have days where we give in to worry and fear and anxiety. But we need to keep remembering the truths that Jesus has given us. Remember the purpose that you have, right? God has made you and saved you on purpose. Seek that purpose. What are the gifts, the talents, the abilities that he's given you? What is he calling you to do and how to live for his kingdom and his glory? You have purpose. You have value. And God loves you. And you know, fear destroys hope, but love destroys fear. 
And so I think part of the key in all of this is remembering that the one who is teaching us these things, the one who said, do not worry about tomorrow, the one who said, don't worry about your life, the one who said, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added to you, loves you so much, so much that he was willing to go to the cross for you, to bear your sin, to die in your place. He's risen from the dead and he offers you his forgiveness and his love and his unconditional acceptance, not because you're good, not because you're worthy, but because he is good and he is worthy and because he loves you. John, First John chapter four, verse 18 says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Love destroys fear. There is no fear in love. And so I think that one of the, the real keys is understanding and receiving and believing and experiencing the love that God has for you. He offers you unconditional love, love that you don't have to earn, love that you don't deserve, but he offers it to you and to me freely and fully. He lived for you. He died for you. He rose for you. He ascended to the Father. He's praying for you. Jesus is praying for you right now. He's rooting for you. And one day he's coming again in power and in glory. And one day he's going to establish his kingdom and bring his kingdom to earth. And we're going to live in and for that kingdom for all of eternity. And gone will be sin, pain, suffering, disease, uncertainty, fear. All of those things will be gone. And we look forward to that day with incredible hope. But right now, God still wants you to live with hope. He wants you to live with hope even in these difficult and challenging days. The one who died for you, the one who defeated death, the one who knows you by name, he holds your future and he's with you. And he wants you to live with hope. He doesn't want us living in fear and in worry and anxiety. But instead, he wants us to remember, right? Remember that you have a purpose. So today I want you to remember you have a purpose, right? And I want you to seek and discover and live for that purpose. You're God's masterpiece created in Christ Jesus for good works. Live for him today. You're valued by God. Remember that you're valued. Remember your worth, right? Jesus says, you know, you, you are so much more valued. God knows everything about these birds, right? You can probably hear some of the birds behind me. God knows everything about every one of them. And how much more does he value you who are made in his image, whom he died for and rose from the dead for, who's praying for your value? You are loved, right? And sometimes we doubt God's love for us. And maybe because something we've done or something we're going through, but listen, God loves you unconditionally. It's not about your performance. It's not about how you're doing in your walk with him. God loves you with an amazing, perfect, unending love. And he wants you to receive and experience and live in that love because fear is destroyed by love. Listen, feelings of fear and doubt and worry and anxiety are going to come. That's not something we can avoid, but it's what we do next that's so important. And I just want you to know today that the one who died for you will not fail you. The one who died for you will not let you go. And the one who died for you will be with you in every circumstance. And so real hope is available for you. Perfect love casts out fear. Live for his purposes. Know his value on your life, right? Really believe I am valued by my father in heaven, right? He has given me that value. It's not a value that I created. It's not a value that I conjured up. It's a value that he's placed on me and he loves you so much. Receive that, believe that, experience that love today. Fear is the enemy of hope, but Jesus is able to break that power. I want to close by uh, just sharing the, the, the words of an old hymn. It's a hymn that really functions as a prayer. It's one that we've sung at hymn to, uh, sing times. I call it hymn times. Sing times in the past. And I would much rather hear all of you sing this th this morning than me read it to you. I, I could just, and I can right now even just uh, hear your voices. And I miss those voices so much this summer. But I, I want to encourage you with these words. So let's close with this old hymn. It's called Abide With Me. The words say, Abide with me, fast falls the even tide. 
The darkness deepens. Lord, with me abide. When other helpers fail and comforts flee, help of the helpless, O abide with me. Swift to close ebbs out life's little day. Earth's joys grow dim, its glories pass away. Change and decay in all around I see. O thou who changest not, abide with me. I need thy presence every passing hour. What by thy grace can foil the tempter's power? Who like thyself my guide and strength can be? Through cloud and sunshine, O abide with me. I fear no foe with thee at hand to bless. Ills have no weight and tears no bitterness. Where is death's sting? Where grave thy victory? I triumph still if thou abide with me. Hold thou thy cross before my closing eyes. Shine through the gloom and point me to the skies. Heaven's morning breaks and earth's vain shadows flee. In life, in death, O Lord, abide with me. It's my prayer that you will know the abiding presence of your Savior Jesus. And his presence will help you to experience his living hope today. Fear, worry, anxiety, those feelings will come. But you have a purpose. You are valued. You are loved. And love destroys fear. May you live in God's eternity-altering, life-giving hope today. God bless you, and have a great day.